So we're going to talk about healing tonight. And um, when I became a Christian um, at 17, then became a young life leader. Young life leader discipled me. It's the best thing that ever happened to me. Uh, I didn't have an opinion about healing. Uh, I, and, and if you ask me to pray for you, I, yeah, sure, I pray for you. But I was a young life leader, so I'm, I'm, I've got high school kids. Not sick, you know. Uh, so we didn't have, have much experience praying for people. And then I got to seminary where I could get a great theological education, and I found out God stopped healing. So now, so I really didn't pray for people. And I, I started a church. Uh, I still led people to Christ, and the church grew and prospered. Uh, but we didn't pray for people because uh, my seminary professor said God doesn't heal anymore. Uh, and, and they said that he healed. And, 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 and if you said, wait a minute, wait a minute. It, when you turn to the New Testament, he's healing right and left. And when you turn to the book of Acts, he's healing right and left. And do you realize in every chapter of the book of Acts, something supernatural happens? Or there's a report of something supernatural that happened before? Every single chapter? So how do you have a book like that and you say God's not healing anymore? Well, here's what we said. I mean, here's what they told me, and then I became a professor and repeated it to my students. Uh, God healed to show that the apostles were trustworthy teachers of doctrine. Now we've got their doctrine, which is really the most important thing in life, Bible doctrine. So uh, we don't need healing anymore. Pretty simple, right? Great. And, and I was young, and my church was young, and so, yeah, and, okay, fine. Um, and so that was my position uh, the, the Scripture teaches God doesn't heal anymore. That was my position. Um, and I just inherited it from, uh, uh, from my professors. But you know what? I, I never studied the New Testament to see what it said about healing. I, I studied to see what it said about everything else. If you ask me about the deity of Jesus, I can prove it seven ways from sundown. Or that he died on the cross in our place for our sins. It's called substitutionary atonement. I can prove that from the Old Testament and the New Testament. Uh, I could win any argument on those kind of things, but healing, I, I just never studied it. And then one of my heroes, I had a conversation with him, un totally unexpected, called me on the phone. And he was, we used all of his books. He was a British professor of psychiatry. His name was uh, Dr. John White, uh, stunningly brilliant. And I knew that from reading what he had uh, written. And uh, we ended up in a phone conversation and he, he told me uh, that he not only believed in healing, but he prayed for healing and he'd seen people healed. They, that's one of my heroes. A guy I know is godly, I know he is smart, and I know he knows the scripture. I had never talked with anybody who was biblically literate and believed in healing. Ever. That's how, that was the kind of impenetrable isolation that my crew lived in. We just didn't associate with people outside of our theological circle. And, and so that conversation didn't convince me, it unnerved me. And it got me to go back and, and uh, oh, and we'd ask him to come to our church <laughs> and, uh, and to do a conference. And, and so now my hero's calling me saying, I think I can do this, Jack. And, uh, and he says that he would like, he would like to, one of the lectures that he would give, he would like to give a lecture on healing. That was awful. Uh, and then uh, he made it worse. He, he said, uh, and if I come to your church, if I come to your church, uh, I would want to pray for the sick. I said, in the church? <laughs> he said, well, we can work out the details. Uh, now, I'm, a, I'm still a seminary professor. I'm a seminary professor. I teach Old Testament exegesis, Semitic languages. I teach Greek. Uh, when I can con my way into the New Testament department to get them to let me do it. And, uh, and, and I'm a pastor. It, and so, so he says, uh, well, Jack, I mean, we can work out the details when I get there, uh, but I wouldn't want to just come and talk about something and not do it. And I go, why not? We do it all the time in seminary. <laughs> you know, we tell students they have to evangelize, but we don't evangelize. <laughs> I never heard another professor, there were 70 of us, and I never heard another professor in my 20 years at seminary say they led anyone to the Lord. Yeah, yeah, that, no, that's, that's, I'm not bad-mouthing my seminary, I was one of those guys. I, I led people to the Lord until I became a professor. Uh, but I didn't, I stopped. 
I, I just looked after the sheep. I said, you know, let, I'm a teacher. Let somebody else go catch sheep. Catch, uh, catch sheep. I'm a, I'm a sheep cleaner. You know, I teach. And uh, so I thought, man, that, that is so I go back to the elders. We got there's seven of us who are elders that govern this church, and I say, guys, I got some good news and I got some bad news. And they said, what's the good news? I go, we got Dr. John White for our spring Bible conference. They go, all right. We're high-fiving each other. We got this famous guy that's coming to our church. And they go, what would be the bad news? I said, well, he wants to give a lecture on healing. They all go, healing? You don't mean physical healing. Well, that's what I said, but he, he definitely means physical healing. And, and they go, really? I go, yeah, but that ain't the worst of it. They go, what could be worse than a lecture on healing? I go, he wants to pray for the sick. In the church? I go, I think so. I think that's what he's intended to do. So we have a debate for the next two hours whether we're going to let someone come to our church and pray for the sick. <laughs> and finally, all the guys, I'm the guy that started the church, right? So I'm, I'm, we got seven elders, but de facto, I'm the leader of the church. And so they, they turned to me and they go, so what do you think, Jack? And, and, and we had all agreed that if we let him come to the church and pray for the sick, it could blow our church up, destroy it. So they said, so what do you think we should do, Jack? And I said, well, I think it's true. Uh, I think it could blow the church up. Uh, but I think we ought to do it. And uh, if the church blows up, you know, people will be fine. They're like quail. They'll go cubby up someplace else. And, and we'll just go start another church. We started this one from nothing. We can start another church. You go, yeah, okay, good. We can, yeah, well, okay, let's have them. <laughs> Nobody goes, God, do you have an opinion in this? Didn't even occur to us to pray. So I'm just telling you where we were spiritually, right? We can figure this out. I mean, you know, God can give an opinion if he wants, but we, we got this. And uh, so what happened to me was over the next four months before he came to the uh, church, I studied every single healing story in the New Testament. Remember what we told the students? God healed to show the apostles were trustworthy teachers of doctrine. So I know how to study the Bible by, by this time. And so I just take out my, uh, uh, my notebook and I read every single healing story and I write down op theological observations about every single healing story. And you know what I found? Not one time did he ever heal to show the apostles were, apostles were trustworthy teachers of doctrine. Not one time. Why would we ever think that the authority of the Bible rests on healing miracles? The authority of the Bible rests on the one who spoke the Bible, God. So then I, I found out, well, why did he heal? Well, there's like 10 or 12 reasons. And, and, here, and, and none of them are rooted in historical transitions. They're rooted in the eternal character of God. Now, I want to give you some of the reasons uh, uh, why God heals out of the New Testament that I just discovered uh, for, for the very first time uh, 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 as a pastor. And, and why is this important? Why is what I'm about to say important? Because if I know Scripture teaches it, then I can have confidence to do it. My, my confidence, this is not church tradition. This is not someone else's opinion. This is what the Scripture says about healing. Um, will God speak today? Well, what does the scripture say? If I believe the scripture teaches that God speaks to us individually outside of scripture, not in contradiction to scripture, but outside of scripture, then I have confidence to ask him to speak to me and to try to hear his voice, right? Okay, so that was, that was kind of my mentality. So why does he heal? He heals in response to faith. You remember the, uh, the lady who'd been bleeding for those 12 years? And she sneaks up behind him, and she goes, I could just touch the hem of his garment. And she touches the hem of his garment, and he stops. And he says, who touched me? And Peter goes, Lord, everybody touched you. You're in a crowd. <laughs> and he goes, no, no. I felt power go out from me. And, and, and so uh, the, she lifts up her head, and she goes, it was me. <laughs> This is one of the coolest things. He could have just let that slide, but he didn't. You know why? Because he had love for that woman, and he wanted to make sure she understood it wasn't the garment that healed her. You remember what he said to her? 
Go in peace, daughter. Your faith has healed you. He wanted to make sure that she knew it was her confidence in him, not in his clothing, that healed her. So she doesn't go into that realm of magic. He's so great. So great. All these people pressing on him. But man, he's got time for one person that's bled for 12 years. Uh, what's faith? It's confidence in Jesus to do what he said he would do. It's just real simple. Uh, does he promise to heal everyone? I have a lot of friends who, in, in the Pentecostal realm who say, yes, that's his promise. I don't, think, I, I don't believe that. Uh, I don't think he promises to heal everyone. Paul says, Trophimus, I left sick at Miletus, 2 Timothy 4.20. Uh, Timothy, in 1 Timothy 5, Paul says, Timothy, take a little wine for your stomach's sake and what? And your frequent illnesses. Does that sound like somebody who believes that if you've got enough faith, you can be healed? If Paul believed that, he wouldn't, he wouldn't have been recommending medicine to Timothy. He would have said, Timothy, you've got to get your faith working, boy. But he didn't say that because Paul knows what we all know. Not everybody gets healed. Um, so what does he promise? To turn to this. So uh, here, here's a verse I live by when I'm praying for the sick. Does, does God promise to heal everybody? My opinion, no. What does he promise? Uh, Hebrews 4, 16. Hebrews 4, 16. Hebrews 4, 16. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence. God rules the world from the throne of grace. He says, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Every time I go before that throne of grace with confidence... I can be sure God is going to give me mercy and grace to help. Sometimes that grace is going to take the form of a major healing or the deliverance. Sometimes it's going to take the form of power to endure. How do you know which one you're going to get? Well, unless he tells us ahead of time, we don't know. So if, if I pray for healing or somebody prays for healing in my body and I don't get it, it doesn't depress me. Uh, uh, I, I might have wished for it, but it doesn't depress me because I have confidence that he's, that pain is going to take me to a deeper place in God that I, I otherwise wouldn't have got there. He's a good father. You, you know, a lot of us are mothers and fathers. We would never intentionally cause our children pain unless we thought it was necessary for their good, Right? Why would we think God is less apparent than we are? So what's faith? Faith is confidence uh, in Jesus to give us grace whenever we ask for it. And he will give it in time to help. That's what it says here. Grace to help us in our time of need. Grace or mercy. And it can take the form of a, a healing, a deliverance, or it can take the form of power to endure. And you know what? In the long run, it doesn't really matter. As long as I'm bringing glory to God and, and, and enduring will bring glory to God. Most important appointment of my life is standing before the judgment seat of Christ and having him pronounce, well done, good and faithful servant, or maybe not pronounce anything. Um, we're all going to ha have that uh, encounter individually. Nobody else, just us right before the throne of grace, and I want to be able to hear him. I, I don't have confidence I'm going to hear it right now, but I want to be able to hear him say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Some people are not going to hear that. Uh, my, my idea, uh, w the way I envision it, is uh, I see uh, you know, the, the, the world of believers appearing before the Son of God, and David stands before him, and, and the Lord Jesus says, well done, my good and faithful servant. Then Joan stands before him. And he says, well done, my good and faithful servant. Then I stand before him, and he just looks at me with sad eyes and goes on to the next person. I think that would be the greatest pain in the world is to, is to see this glorious, beautiful person uh, with spiritual eyes and realize I wasted my life on something so inferior, and, and I didn't 
gain his approval. I'm still going to heaven. I'm still, yeah, I'm going to be in heaven. Because heaven, you go to heaven not based on your works, but based on him. One time in my life, I trusted him to forgive me and give me new life. He came into my heart and he'll never leave. That's called acceptance. There's a huge difference between acceptance, being accepted by God and being approved by God. Like we love all of our children. We accept all of our children, but we don't always approve of the way they're behaving. So faith is confidence in Jesus to do what he said he would do. What he says he will do is every single time he will give us mercy and grace to help. Maybe it takes the form of a healing. Maybe it takes the form of, of, uh, of, of power to endure. Um, so that's one reason. Another reason he heals is uh, simply because he's asked. He doesn't even give a reason. So uh, they come to him in Mark chapter 7, and they bring the man who's mute and deaf, remember that one? And they just ask him to lay his hands on him, and he spits on his fingers, puts it in the guy's ears, the guy hears. It, it doesn't say they had faith. It doesn't say it, but he just heals because he's asked. And, and I've got stories of people just asking, like in despair or anger, and getting healed. He'll, he'll heal just because he's uh, asked. Uh, he'll heal to bring glory to his Father. When he went to raise Lazarus from the dead in, in uh, John 12, remember what he says? That he's bringing glory to his Father. And so there are like maybe eight or nine reasons in the New Testament, maybe ten. Why he heals. The, uh, it, it often says he heals to, uh, to, because he had compassion or mercy on people, right? The widow of Nain, she's walking behind the coffin of her son. And, and it says, and Jesus touched the coffin, the boy jumps up, and it says he had compassion on the widow. So you, you, people say, oh, he's not healing anymore. And I want to say, where does compassion go? When, when did he stop showing compassion on the, on the hurting? Um, he'll heal uh, uh, he'll not only heal because, uh, because of our faith or because we're, uh, we're asked he'll heal to open wide doors to evangelism so in uh, Acts chapter uh, 9 um, uh, Peter Raises, uh, raises the paralytic Aeneas, it's Acts chapter 9, verse 35, and it says, all who lived in Lydda and Sharon saw him and turned to the Lord. Uh, a, a, a miracle doesn't guarantee people are going to uh, come to the Lord, but it opens wide doors for evangelism. And, and uh, shortly after that, he raised Dorcas from the dead, and it says, this became known all over Joppa, this is also Acts 9, and uh, many believed in the Lord. So if, when you start looking up all the healing stories, you just start finding these reasons. They just pop out. Uh, like he heals Peter's uh, mother-in-law in Mark chapter 1 so that she could get up and wait on them. So sometimes he'll heal to remove an obstacle to our ministries. Just simple. Um, He'll heal to honor his promise to the elders, right? In, in uh, James chapter 5, he, he says, are you sick? Then go to the elders, and the elders of the church will pray for you, and the prayer offered in faith is going to raise you up. Now, I was the, an elder in a Bible-believing church, and for seven years we never prayed over the sick because <laughs> no one ever asked us to. And no one ever asked us to because I stood on the stage and said, God's not healing anymore. <laughs> so, but, you know, that verse, James, is actually in Scripture. You know, elders are supposed to pray for the sick. And, and finally, one of the wives, uh, one of the elders' wives, got a, a big tumor uh, in her esophagus or by her esophagus, they thought the size of a grapefruit. And so finally, this elder comes to us and asks if we will pray for his wife. Is one of our elders. I mean, so what are we going to say? No. Uh, but we, so, so me and the two other main guys uh, who were elders and, and also seminary graduates, we kind of look at it and go, how do we do this? I mean, 
I, I guess we probably should anoint with oil, right? And then we go, yeah, probably should, okay. Uh, what kind of oil do you want to use? Uh, we knew it wasn't going to be motor oil. We knew, we knew better than that. <laughs> but like, like uh, it's, it's olive oil probably, right? Okay. Does it have to come for Israel or is Italian olive oil okay? <laughs> so, so we're kind of debating what, what, what country the olive oil has to come from. <clears throat> and we decide, oh, we'll take whatever the supermarket has. And uh, now, so we, the seven of us, oh, oh now, so now we've got a bottle of oil and we've got this poor lady sitting on her white couch and the seven of us are gathered around her, and now we got to figure out, how do you get this stuff on her? Um, I mean, do you just pour it? Then? They probably get on stuff. I don't know if you do that. And then it's like, okay, well, maybe a dab, and, and, but then is it just one guy that dabs her, or do we all seven dab her? And so we don't want to get this wrong, so we decide we'll all seven dab her <laughs> to make it official. <laughs> I'm serious. I mean, we're, we're debating this. So finally, after we've got the lit, poor lady doused in prayer, I mean, doused in oil, then we get to the prayer part. So the first six of us pray for the doctor, the surgeon's hands, for comfort for the, we forget to ask God to heal her. Because that's what we would do. We would go to the hospital and, you know, you're a pastor, so you got to go to the hospital. Somebody gets sick. And we'd usually pray for God to guide the hands of the surgeon <laughs> instead of heal the person. Because, you know, God's not healing anymore, right? So best thing we can do is maybe he's working with surgeons. So we'll just pray for the old doc. And so the, the, the first six of us, we prayed for the old doc and uh, kind of prayed around her tumor. And then the seventh guy, who wasn't really a theologian, he was just a counselor, uh, he, he prays. Uh, he says, God, I have such faith. I pray when they open her up tomorrow that that tumor won't even be there. I open my eyes up. Oh, that's the other thing. We all close our eyes when we pray. Um, so I open my eyes up and I looked at that guy and I wanted to deck him right off that couch. I'm thinking, you idiot. You just destroyed that woman's faith. I mean, when they open up her tomorrow and find out all that malignancies in there, I mean, her faith is just going to crash. And I don't know why, but people who don't believe in healing believe that if you ask for it and it doesn't happen, it'll destroy your faith. Now, I've, I was a fairly old Christian by then, and I had lots of unanswered prayers, and none of them destroyed my faith. Well, why would I think a prayer for healing that didn't get answered would destroy my faith? I don't know, but that's pretty common among people who don't believe in healing. Um, so anyway, they, uh, they did uh, do the surgery the next day, and the tumor was still there, but it wasn't malignant, just a coincidence. And so she was still with us last time I checked. That was our first time to do the James 5 thing. thing. Um, so God will heal to keep his promise to the elders of, uh, of the church. Um, let's see if there's something. Those, those are kind of the main reasons. I've written all this down in a book. Um, the main reason we don't see more healings uh, I think, is because we don't ask. See, if, if, we, if we never told anybody the gospel, we wouldn't see anybody come to the Lord. And, and I did tell people the gospel, uh, but I wasn't praying for healing, so that's why I wasn't seeing uh, more healings. Uh, uh, unbelief is probably the number one reason that we don't see more healings in the church. And unbelief keeps them keeps us from asking. What's unbelief? It's doubting God's power, his wisdom, or his goodness. Now, even when I didn't believe in healing, I never doubted God's power. I go, he could do this if he wants to. Uh, I didn't doubt his wisdom. I mean, he knows what he's doing. I doubted his goodness. And you know how I doubted it? I thought that healing depended on the quality of my spiritual life or the quality of the person being prayed for. That's doubting God's goodness. If he has to wait for my spiritual life, then nobody's going to get healed. Or has to wait for somebody to deserve healing, nobody's going to get healed because nobody's ever going to deserve it. But that was so ingrained in my system, it just sneaked up on me and I... And I, and I I probably prayed for people for years before I realized 
what one of the major hindrances was in my uh, life. Unbelief is the main reason we don't see more healing. Uh, I've, in, in all the years I've prayed for people, I've only had one person say, I don't think God has the power to do this. We were praying for a judge's wife in our church, and this was after we started believing in healing. We were praying for a judge's wife. She had a tumor, and uh, there were about eight or nine of us, and we'd gathered in the, we met her in the evening, and we, we were at our church. And so we were gathered around, we were praying for her, and her husband, the judge, was standing over there. So we were here praying, and he's standing over here like this, just making sure that we get the message. He doesn't believe in any of this. <laughs> Not really supporting his wife. I think he's just there to make sure we don't abuse her. And, uh, and, and so we were praying, and it, absolutely nothing was happening. And I could tell nothing was happening. And if nothing's happening, it's just dumb to keep doing the same thing you're doing, right? So I stop, and uh, I, I look at her, and I say, um, do you think uh, God has the power to do this? And she said, uh, well, uh, uh, he's God, isn't he? I mean, he's got the power to do anything. I go, yeah, but do you think... He has the power to heal you right now. And she said, uh, not really. Maybe if we'd caught this sooner. And so I just smiled and I said, you know, it doesn't really make any difference how advanced it is or when we catch it. Uh, and I started, you know, telling her about the nature of healing God. And then I told her some healing stories of other, other people who had had uh, cancer, had tumors that we had prayed for. And, uh, and I just watched hope by the Holy Spirit come into her uh, face. And then we started praying for her again, and it was different. And uh, they did do surgery. There was a tumor there, but it wasn't malignant. And, and, I, and for, uh, for, she was with us for years. I don't remember how much longer, but for uh, a long time. It's the only person that I ever prayed for that doubted that God had the power. Most of the time, what we're doubting is God's goodness. We're thinking that somehow we don't deserve this. And that's so true. We don't deserve anything uh, from God. It has nothing to do with our desserts. It has everything to do with his uh, goodness. Um, so I, uh, uh, and then here's the, probably one of the more controversial things. Um, I've got Pentecostal friends who say the cross guarantees healing in this life. I totally believe that the cross guarantees healing of everything, but not in this life. Because I, can find, I, I can't find that clear promise. I can find some text that might suggest that. One interpretation might suggest that. But I can't find clear texts that teach it, and I find uh, contrary examples in Scripture, uh, like Paul to Timothy, take a little wine for your stomach's sake, and and your frequent illnesses. And he's not telling him, you got to get your faith working, Timothy. Uh, Paul seems to know what we all know, that not everybody is going to get healed in this, uh, in this life. So I don't think the cross guarantees healing. And I think it's probably bad to teach, I think it's bad to teach that. Uh, for number one, it's not true. But number two, what happens when you don't get healed? Well, yeah, you must, you don't believe in the cross or there's something defective in your faith or there's sin in your life. Um, then and the, uh, do that. When, when I pray, I pray for lots of people that don't get healed. And, and what I say is, uh, if they ask me why, I go, I don't know why, you, why, but we're, we'll pray for you next week and we'll pray for you every week till you get healed or until God says, uh, to, tells one of us or you to, that we're supposed to stop praying. And occasionally, you know, God will tell somebody that he's not going to heal them. He's going to give them power to endure. Most of the time, that he, he, doesn't, he just leaves that area unspoken, and we just gradually find out whether we're going to get healed or, or not. Okay, let's see if there's anything else I want to say before we start praying. Um, how much faith does it take to get healed? Short answer, not much, not much. Uh, I've seen healing from... from uh, just the uh, smallest uh, amount of faith you could possibly uh, believe. Not, not much at all. Uh, we had a lady that came to one of our meetings years ago. I was doing training sessions on a weeknight, Wednesday or something, for like 300 people in, in Fort Worth and to, from different churches. And I was teaching about hearing God's voice and about, uh, about healing and all that. So one night we were doing the healing thing, 
And uh, so a lady comes and she's never been to any meetings like that. And she's got a uh, horrible carpal tunnel, carpal tunnel syndrome, not only in her wrist and her elbows, but in her shoulders. It hurts to carry her purse. That's how bad it was. So she comes to the meeting and one of us had a word about uh, bone and joint healings. And uh, so we just asked everybody to stand up that had any kind of bone and joint problems and half or more of the room stood up. And so she goes, yeah, what have I got to lose? And so she stood up and, and so one of us led in, in prayer for the, for the group and, uh, and, 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 uh, and then we dismissed and she goes, well, I didn't think anything would happen. Uh, so she, she wasn't massively disappointed because she didn't expect anything. She just stood up and then she reached down, grabbed her purse and started to walk out like that. And she realizes there's no pain in her shoulder. And there's no pain in this shoulder. Her wrist, she completely healed. So people say, how much faith did it, does it take to get healed? Well, sometimes just the faith to stand up or just the faith to let somebody pray for, pray for you. Uh, that, was all, that was all the faith that she had. And I thought, God is so good. Uh, you know, he had a plan for her, and, and that's all the faith he uh, required of her. Um, let's see if there's anything else. Uh, Okay, do uh, you have any questions you want to ask about, uh, about healing? Is all healing instant? Is all healing instant? No. Uh, some is uh, uh, gradual. Some is instant. Some is gradual. Some, some can take place over a long period of uh, time. Uh, I wish it were all instant, but I, I had, that's not been my experience. We're healed by his wounds. Well, we are healed by his wounds. We're, 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 we will, the cross, not just healing, but every single blessing here and in the life to come comes through the cross of Jesus. Everything. It's the fount of every good thing. Uh, the question is not whether there's healing in the cross or the atonement. Uh, the question is, does the cross guarantee healing in this physical life right here? I mean, everybody knows we're, we're going to be healed, you know, in, in heaven. And I'm saying, no, I don't think the cross guarantees that we're going to be healed in this life. I, Paul tells Timothy, take a little wine for your stomach's sake and your, your frequent illnesses. Does that sound like a person, I mean, he's an apostle, he's, you know, on up there. Does that sound like in a person who believes that everybody should be healed in this life? It doesn't. I mean, he would have said what my Pentecostal friends would say, and that's just get your faith working. You need to be, you know, you, need to, you just need to believe you can be healed in this life now. You need to believe it now. Um, so the, the, the cross guarantees healing. The cross guarantees every single blessing we have comes through the cross. Everything. Uh, good question. Anything else? Yeah. Okay, so here, this is a great question. Oh, okay, okay. Where they have been healed by someone else's belief. For example, you believe, you're believing that you're praying for someone who was not born again, even though they needed to be healed. Have you experienced healing that kind of thing? So, so are you saying you're, you're praying for a person to be healed, but that person doesn't know it or they do know it? Yeah, they're, they're, yeah I, I, the, answer, the short answer is yes. I, I've, I've seen people healed who didn't believe they were going to get healed. It, the healing totally surprised them. And, and some people who were going, okay, out of courtesy, I'll let this guy pray for me or I'll let this group pray for me, uh, and then they get healed. Uh, and sometimes I've seen it happen immediately. Sometimes it's a couple days later. If it's a couple days later, they tend not to credit it with, to God so much as, well, it wasn't that bad a sickness. Uh, but yeah, the answer is 
uh, I, I do see people, I have seen people healed uh, that didn't really believe they were going to be healed, um, but it was through somebody else's faith. There's faith somewhere when a healing takes place. But at least most of the time I know about healing or when I know it, when, I, when I've seen it, there's faith somewhere, whether it's in the person being prayed for or the people praying uh, for the person. And, and once in a while, I will actually know before I pray for the person, they're going to be healed. That, that's rare, but sometimes I actually know that. Most of the time when I pray, it's just a pure request. God, and it's based on, God, you're good. You heal people all the time. Would you heal this person? But uh, once in a while, I know they're going to be uh, healed. I had to, uh, uh, one of the ladies on our healing team, she was phenomenal. Her name was Karen Herson. This was in Anaheim, California. We had a huge healing team, and I was over the whole healing team. Uh, she's three months pregnant, and, uh, and, and she calls me, and she's just hysterical on the phone. I can't even understand her. And uh, she's just come back from the doctor. He did a sonogram, and her baby, her, her baby girl only has one kidney. And her husband had concealed from her until that moment that there was a birth defect on his side of the family and the women who, who were, only had one kidney. So she's hysterical. And the doctors tried to assure her that she was going to be, the, the baby was going to have, the baby would be fine, he, that she would be able to live with one kidney. And, and it took me like five minutes just to get her just calm enough and, and, and to, so I could actually understand the story. And then I said to her, when, she, when I understood the story, then I said to her, Karen, don't worry. Just come into the office. We'll pray for your baby, and, and God will give her a new kidney. I was over all the healing teams in Anaheim, and my cardinal rule was do not promise healing under any circumstances. And I just violated my major rule and promised her healing. <laughs> and she goes, she goes, really? And she, when she gets like hope in her voice, you know, she stopped crying. And I go, yeah, yeah, just come in. We'll, we'll pray for you and God will give your baby another kidney. And then I hung the phone up and I go, what did you just do? <laughs> and I just look, I go, God, I hope that was you. <laughs> and, and, and she came in and Steve Zeret, who was over all the business side of the, the Anaheim Vineyard, he and I laid hands on her. And she vibrated like crazy. She said it felt like a popcorn machine was going off inside of her womb. Uh, she's all over the place. And, and she went back, I think it was like 10 days later, baby had uh, two kidneys. And so a, a friend of mine, I was showing the x-rays to a friend of mine who's a, uh, an internist, a really smart internist. And he goes, Jack, he goes, do you understand this is like a first-rate miracle that when a, a, a baby in the womb doesn't have something, it never comes back. He goes, this is impossible. This is like a first-rate miracle. And I've had a couple of those uh, where, I just, where I just said, uh, but it just got out of my mouth before I realized what I'd said, and then it turned out to be true. But normally I don't promise you. I had a guy call me from Dallas Seminary uh, a couple of years ago, this was, uh, this was right when the, I think the COVID thing had started. And he called me, he's a graduate from Dallas Seminary, and he said, my father-in-law is the godliest man I know. He's in the hospital, and he's, uh, they don't think he's going to make it through tonight. Uh, he's got COVID, his esophagus is da -da -da, and it just went like this ton of stuff, and they said uh, they're, they're preparing us to lose him uh, tonight. Uh, he says, I don't know how healing works. Can we pay you some money and would you pray for him? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, I don't think he'd actually read the book. He just, you know, because he's a Dallas Seminary graduate, he'd heard about the Dallas professor who went astray and started praying for people. And so, <laughs> so I said, uh, <clears throat> no, it doesn't cost anything. Uh, right. <clears throat> they said, well, they won't let us go in the room. And, and I said, well, well can, can you go stand in the parking lot tonight? And, and, she, and he says, that's what we do. We stand in the parking lot and we pray for him. We look up to his window. And I said, okay, go stand in the parking lot tonight and, and, and call me when you're there and we'll pray for him. And so we did. And he wasn't supposed to make it through the night. He not only made it through the night, the next day the doctor said, we don't know what happened to him. His esophagus is perfect. He was like instantaneously healed. And I knew 
when they were standing in that parking lot. I mean, I say I knew, I was pretty certain that God was going to uh, heal this uh, heal this guy, and, and, and he did, and still healed, and still doing uh, well. Uh, isn't that great? I mean, that's just, <laughs> doctor's not, he's not going to make it through the night, and then the doctor said, we don't understand this. This is a total, doctors were saying, it's a total uh, miracle. First lady we prayed for, Lisa and I prayed for her after we started believing in healing. Her name was Ruth Gay. And uh, she had an aneurysm. And, and so uh, she, she, uh, she asked us if we would come to her house and pray for her on Monday night. She's got an aneurysm. You know, the, the, the uh, blood vessel is thinned and it's in danger of bursting right up here on the right side of her head. And they're going to do a uh, angiogram, a second angiogram on Wednesday morning, and then they're going to operate on to, to see if it's expanded or whatever. And then they're going to operate on her uh, Wednesday morning to repair the, the aneurysm. So we, at least, and I go sure. So we go over to her house, and loneliest place in the world. Uh, it's like she hadn't had a visitor forever. She had cookies and iced tea, and all that. She was estranged from her daughter, left by her husband, uh, daughters. Uh, so all completely alone, one of the most dismal places I've ever just walked into like that, and just you could actually feel the loneliness in the room. So both of us, we just laid our hands on her head and just prayed real quietly. So we, this was like the maybe the first or second person we prayed for after we believed in, in healing. So, uh, so that's on Monday night. Wednesday morning, she's going in to, uh, to have the angiogram and to do the uh, surgery. She calls me Wednesday morning. Her voice is still, uh, her voice is still really soft. She's still got the effects of the anesthesia there. And she said, Jack, I've been healed. I go, what? She said, I've been healed. I go, what did the doctor say? The doctor said, you've been healed. And, and they said they, she said, they did the angiogram, and there's no aneurysm there. And I, I said, what did the doctor say? He goes, he, he, the doctor said it was a miracle. He said, I've never seen this happen in my whole practice. And uh, so the, the, about that time, the Dallas Morning News was doing an article on me and putting me on the cover of the D Magazine. That's their Sunday magazine because it was such a big deal the Dallas Seminary professor was praying for sick people. And, and I got fired for praying for sick people. Uh, I actually got fired for being friends with John Wimber and praying for sick people. But the worst thing was I was friends with John Wimber, a charismatic. You know, that's, when, when you start associating with charismatics, I mean, you're in trouble. And... Uh, because they only go one way. And um, so the, the magazine uh, put me on the cover of the magazine. <coughs> and they went to interview that doctor, and he would not talk to them. They, even on the phone, he would not confirm that this lady had been uh, healed, even though she asked him to uh, confirm it. Now, I've got friends, a lot of friends who are doctors who pray for the sick all the time. But some are just so anti Healing, they just don't want to do anything that's going to help the cause, you know? I don't know. <coughs> oh. I am so glad you brought up Acts 3. I intended to bring that up because it's one of the greatest scriptures on healing in the New Testament. Uh, it takes so much pressure off of us. So here's what Peter says to the crowd. They're all gathered around because, you know, you know, it's the lame man in Acts 3, right? He can't walk. And, and then, the, like you say, Peter says, silver gold we don't have, but what I do have, I give to the name of Jesus, rise and walk. The guy gets up leaping and dancing, and the whole place goes wild. And... Uh, and then Peter says, he's got this huge crowd around him, and, and he says this, men of Israel, why do you stare at us as if by our godliness or power we made this man whole? So we all know it's God's power, right? But we tend to fall into that form of unbelief where if we're not godly enough, he's probably not going to get healed. And I just, that passage is so freeing to me when I pray for people because, man, there's so many things I don't do that I should do and so many inconsistencies in my life. But when I start thinking about those, when I start to pray for somebody, I go, I just, I just think of what Peter said, as if by our godliness, this guy got healed. And I, and I just said, thank you, Lord. It's not, not up to my godliness. So I'm just making a request. Um, that's a great, great passage to set us free from the tyranny of uh, we got to be godly to see somebody healed. 
Uh, I'll do it. But, you know, it's gonna, you know, that's the plan. That's the plan. I'll tell you one more story. <laughs> I'll tell you. Uh, uh, I'll, God has told you that this is a healing night. No, I think we, we planned on this being a healing night. So we planned on being a healing and revealing night. So uh, David asked me to tell you one story that took place in his church. It's one of the, uh, one of the greatest nights of my life. Um, David was the pastor of a church in Columpton, England. It's a little village in, in southwest England. And uh, it, it, the, the church had this beautiful lattice work from, what, the 13th century? To, yeah, just would cost millions of pounds to be, so just beautiful, beautiful uh, church building. So David asked me to pray. Uh, to, to, uh, so, so I spoke on Sunday morning. And I had my kids with me, and we'd been doing this big conference called the New Wine thing, 10,000 people at it and all that. And, and so my, my kids went to the service, but they didn't want to go to church on Sunday night. They wanted to go, uh, they wanted to, go to London and have some fun. And so they, they said, hey, Dad, can we just skip the church service tonight and go to London and have some fun? And I go, well, let me ask David. And, and I said, is it okay if we don't, I don't come to the church tonight? And David goes, no, 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 no. We have uh, advertised an American healing evangelist is going to be in our service tonight and people from all around these villages will be here to see an American healing evangelist. And I go, you're, you're kidding? He goes, no, I'm not kidding. And, and so I said, okay, well, and I thought, you know, and he said, oh, well, and the other thing you said to me was half the people in the service tonight will be unbelievers. And I thought, oh, this could be interesting. A healing service and half the people are unbelievers. See, no one's ever told an unbeliever God doesn't heal. You have, you have to go to church to get that message. So they don't go to church, so they don't hear that message. So it'll be interesting to see what happens when they come to church and here's this healing evangelist saying God heals tonight. So, okay. Uh, so, uh, so I, so I get on stage, tell, just like dress like this, tell some stories. I'm just having a great time. It's funny. And then we start uh, praying for people, and people are getting healed. And, uh, and, and then, uh, oh, let's see. Uh, I'm trying to think. Uh, this uh, lady... Um, her name is Ann Roberts. She's in a wheelchair. But I never saw her in the, uh, in the service because she's on the very back row. And so we're praying for other things. Um, and, uh, it, and so well, and one of the things I, I said in the uh, uh, service was I think God will heal uh, knees. And, and so what I meant to say was just lift up your spirit to the Lord. But what came out of my mouth was, just lift up your knees to the Lord. <laughs> lift up your, and so, you know, you got people who've never been to church before, pray for healing. Well, maybe that's the way they do, you know. So, <laughs> but I don't see this because I got my eyes closed, all right. And, and so, uh, I'm down at the uh, front, and uh, I can't remember the order of this, but I, I think it was uh, 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 Ann, uh is down at the front being prayed for, and uh, she's in, in some. Two oh, guys that never ever prayed for anybody before. Yeah, older guys, it's brand new. Brand new at praying for people, uh, so they're praying for Ann to get out of the wheelchair, right? And and so Ann Ann says, uh, oh, and Ann hears a voice. She's sitting at the very back of the uh, uh, of the service, and she hears a voice say, "Go down to the front." Here's a voice in her head. So she goes down to the front. And then, uh, so these, these, these older guys that never prayed for anybody like that before, so they go to a wheelchair, they're praying for her uh, to get up. And she hears this voice say, you can get up if you want to. So then she looks up at the guys praying for her, and she says, uh, she goes, I want to get up. And they both go, no, no, don't do that. <laughs> they're praying for her to get up. I just tell you, that's the level of faith they were praying at. So they go over to David, and they said, she wants to get up. She wants to try to get up. What do we do? And David says, let her, let her. And so she gets up, and, and uh, 
I'm, I'm down here. So she, this is all happening right up here at the front. I don't even see this. I'm, I'm down here, and I'm putting my hand up here to pray for a, for a great big old tall blind guy. I'm putting my, getting, putting my hand on this. And, uh, and, 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 I, and I, I got my eyes closed. And then I hear this guy go, that was the most amazing thing. And I'm looking at this guy, and he's doing this. I, he's got his knee. Look, go look at this. Look at this. Look at this. And, and I go, what? He goes, he goes uh, I couldn't even move this when I came in here. It was frozen. And, and, and I said, wow, uh, when, when did that happen? He says, well, whenever you said, just lift up your knees to the Lord. I lifted up my knee to the Lord. I go, I did not say lift up your knees to the Lord. The blind guy goes, oh, yes, you did. Uh, <laughs> And then I hear this scream, and I turn around, and I look, and there's an empty wheelchair and a lady about four feet away. Ann Roberts, uh, completely healed. And I asked, uh, she's still with us, and I asked David, well, what year was that? That was, nine? yeah, 90, I think 96. It was 1996. It was the New Wine Festival, 1996, when we were doing that. Yeah. Oh, I forgot the tumor part. She had seven tumors down her back. She was expected to die quite soon. She really, she had Christian faith, but she didn't believe in healing. It was only about healing that she came because we prophesied to her. And she thought she did it And I found it just moments ago, and I found it in the Yeah. Well, I, I don't remember if I got actually got the records, but I got the statement. I got the statement. yeah statement from yeah. Um, st yeah, still healed, still uh, still with us. And half the place was unbelievers. That was just great. <laughs> it was one of the all-time great healing meetings ever. It was just a blast the whole. Uh, evening. Uh, so <clears throat> let's see if God will heal somebody tonight. And, and let's do this. Let's, let's have, uh, let's ask him to show us. We'll pray for everybody. Anybody that wants prayer, we'll pray for you tonight. But let's start like this. Let, let's ask him to show us whom he will heal. And, and, and so I, I'd like, I'd like for all of us just kind of practice hearing his voice tonight and, to, and uh, we, we call these words of knowledge um, where, where an impression will come. And we're, we're going to start with you all, uh, not, not, not with me. We're going we're to ask him to speak to you. You ask him to speak to you about something he will heal. Now, how, what does that look like? What does it feel like? Okay, so I, so I say, Lord, would you show me whom you want to heal tonight? And then I just get calm and put my mind on him. I stop talking and I just kind of rest. Usually I close my eyes to shut out distractions. And then uh, th three things may happen. I may get a picture that just pops into my mind out of nowhere. Oh, that's the other thing. I'm not, uh, not trying to make a single thing up. I'm not thinking about meetings before where I saw healing. I'm not going through uh, a category of arthritis, bursitis, dermatitis. I'm not doing any of that kind of stuff. Uh, I just got my mind on him. It's blank and, and waiting for for something to pop in. And so uh, a picture can pop in. And so all of a sudden I see a hand. It's a man's hand. And uh, I see a shadow over the little finger. It's the right hand. So this could mean there's something wrong with a man's little finger here on the right hand. And that just, uh, unless he tells me more about the picture, that's just what I would assume. And, and how do you know if that's from him or not? Well, you've got to raise your hand in the meeting and say, I just saw this picture and let's see. So it can be a picture. Or it can be an impression. So no picture, just an impression. We're supposed to pray for, for a man with something wrong with his right little finger. Just an impression. Or the third thing, it can be a physical sensation like Jesus had when the woman touched him, you know. And, and he said, no, somebody touched me. I felt power go out from me. So that, that's not new age. That's Jesus. That, we, we can, that God can speak to us in our body. Sometimes I'll feel uh, like a, a th not pain necessarily in my knee or not pain here in the back, but I'll, f I'll become aware of a little throbbing right here. And that means maybe somebody with something wrong right here in their back in, in the room. And, and how do you know? Well, you just got to raise your hand and, and try it out. So a picture, 
an impression or a sensation are, are three really common ways that he speaks to us when we're in a meeting like this. Now, it, it, this is a good, great way to go to church. So when you go to church and you're sitting in church on Sunday morning, just say, Lord, is there anybody here you want to heal? And, uh, and if all of a sudden a picture, a sensation, or an impression comes to you, then ask him to show you who it is. Usually, if it comes to you in the context I just said, it'll be somebody really close to you. And, in, and, and last time I pastored a church, when I was there, uh, the, uh, everybody knew they had permission to go to a person and say, hey, I just had an impression. I think it might be for you. Are you having pain in your shoulder? Uh, so, and, and, and nobody resents that. You know that? Nobody goes, no, I'm not having pain in my shoulders. <laughs> What do I look like, an arthritic person? Nobody. <laughs> they just feel loved. They feel cared for. Um, and it's, that's kind of a nice way to go to church. What you're really saying is, Lord, would you use me to bring some light and grace and uh, help into someone's life? Okay? So we're going to ask for words of knowledge tonight, and then we'll wait for uh, a minute or so and see if an impression, a picture, uh, or a sensation comes. And the, and the key here is we don't make up anything. We don't try to make anything happen. We just get calm, put our mind on him, and just wait. And he may speak, he may not. It, it's okay. Uh, if we do this often, eventually he's going to speak to, to uh, everyone. Okay, you want to try that? Okay, so about, that's about 50-50. That's, that's enough to try. Okay. So, Father, would you speak to us now?